so we're now we're, we're now recording. Okay, uh, hopefully everyone can hear me, and uh, thank you all for attending what is the uh, last of our uh, quarterly webinars for 2021, um, talking about uh, uh, so you're considering a career as an interim executive. So for those who are either new to the profession or a couple of assignments in, want to make a professional career out of this, um, but uh, are interested in some information as to how you go about doing that. So um, the agenda today I won't read, um, but it will cover the following um, topics. I should say the webinar is being uh, recorded. It's on Zoom. Uh, it will be available on the IIM website together with these slides for any attendee uh, who cares to download uh, either or both of the video and the accompanying information. Um, can we have questions as we go, please, in the Q&A tab, not in the chat tab? That would be fantastic. And... Um, so we'll deal with questions at the end. Uh, there should be enough time to, to, to cover most, if not all of the Q&A. So whatever brings you here today, um, it's, it's either uh, you've been thinking about this for a while, you know someone who does it, you've been made redundant, you've been offered a temporary contract, etc., cetera, et cetera. You, you, you can read those. Um, but how, however you've arrived here, is, is it a career choice or a necessity? Are you curious? Questions like, are you ready? Will anyone want me? Will I be any good? Will I like it? Can I afford to do it? Do I have what it takes? Which I have to say, um, given that my name is Bruce Rayner, I should have introduced myself. I've been uh, doing interim now since I think it's 1992. So someone can do the maths. It's probably coming up for nearly 30 years and I'm still asking myself some of these questions. Will anyone want me? Will I be any good, et cetera, and so on. I'm joined today by Tony Evans, uh, who is also a career interim of some 25 years, uh, has done assignments to CEO level, um, and is also the co-chair of the IIM. Uh, we have Simon Hudson from Morphosis and Lawrence Francis, um, who is up next, who, who is, will introduce himself, uh, but is representing one of the UK's top interim service providers. That's uh, New Street Consultancy Group, formerly um, Interim Partners. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lawrence, whose bio is there on the left of, of the screen, to introduce himself and kick things off. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, good to see you, Tony. Good to see you, Simon. Uh, so I'll... Uh... I'll, I'll introduce myself. I, I, I lead our manufacturing and engineering division here at the New Street Consulting Group. So the New Street Consulting Group, uh, as, as Bruce has, has already highlighted, formerly Interim Partners, is, uh, is an organisation that provides a suite of different services to the human capital space. We 50% um, of what the business does uh, is in the placement of interims, and that's how I spend the majority of my time within the business. And we also provide executive search services and board assessment and executive coaching services to, um, to the C-suite as well. So yeah, my, my day today is to uh, have a seat on the management team for the group and I lead everything that we do from a manufacturing and engineering perspective, which distills down to things like industrial manufacturing, FMCG, pharmaceutical manufacturing, all the way through to aerospace, defense, automotive and energy markets. So it's, uh, it's expansive, it's, um, it's, it's very varied. We cater for uh, all roles at C-suite level and depending on the size of the organization, uh, one or even two levels down. And then we do get involved in some very technical um, specialist areas as well uh, from a change and transformation perspective. I've been in the, I've been in the staffing industry for uh, for over fifteen years. I've been with uh, I've been with the group. I'm uh, I'm working at the senior level, placing interims for nearly five. So um, 
yeah, quite quite a lot of experience overall, and hopefully I'll be able to pass some of that on to the people on the on the webinar today. With regards to um, kicking things off uh, and, and getting into the, uh, the kind of the main the main reason we're all here, the the first thing that we um, that we focus on when we talk to interims is we are typically dealing with people who are right at the top of the pyramid they've got to the very top of their game uh, on the permanent side and more often than not we're dealing with individuals who have found that magic sweet spot where um, you may well have all seen this chart before but where you have a combination of doing what you enjoy doing you know what if, if it's what you love even better uh, that you're good at that you can earn money for doing. And, um, and, and typically when we're dealing with uh, the very best interims, they exist in that nice neat little triangle in the middle of all, all three. Um, and my, my strongest counsel to anybody on this webinar or in life is um, if you're missing one of those three, you are gonna struggle to be um, hugely successful at what you do. Um, next slide please, Bruce. So, um there's uh just bear with me one second so in terms of what is an interim executive so we are going right back to to basics here so that people can sort of understand exactly what it is that the market um perceives an interim executive to be so we're talking about um non-permanent hires an individual who is highly skilled highly experienced uh to, re to repeat myself, has got right to the top of their game in their chosen field, just, just to play, just to be called an interim executive. We're talking about uh, two decades of um, significant achievement in one's chosen field. And you're brought in um, as that specialist to, to, to carry out a specific set of, uh, of activities and deliver a specific goal. So um, in the UK, it's, it, it's classed as... The UK is the most mature market globally for for interim usage. That being said, it's still it's it's it, it's it's still classed as a new industry even in the UK, and so we're still on a journey. Um, and we've been we've been trading for twenty years now. We're still on a journey with our clients to educate them about the benefits of bringing in an interim executive and um so we're always looking to partner with the very best we have to partner with the very best so that the interim can go in and validate what we say an interim can do and uh, we um we get all sorts of pushback uh from clients who are less educated on the uh, on the benefits of bringing them in um and then always once an interim goes in and delivers and, and our clients see the value um, we'll start to get repeat business, but it is still very much, um, albeit it's no longer completely new in the UK. It is, it is um, something that to, to some individuals is, a, is an evolving concept. And what, um, what, what we've, um, just coming on to the final point, what we've learned is that when we find a highly capable interim executive, and that can be anything from an interim managing director, CEO, CFO, they are, um, they are absolutely invaluable because whatever the day rate, they will go in and they will deliver far, far more than that day rate during the course of their tenure with the business. So we, um, you know, we, we, we find that we get, once, once we win the work and the interim secures the work, the feedback at the end of the project, um, pretty much unanimously every time, um, is that it was a it, it was a great move and that they'd do it again. Uh, next slide, please, Bruce. So, why do companies that are uh, they are a little bit more educated? Uh, why do our clients use interims? So, they want to bring in the experience. They want to bring in um, the the people who are at the top of their game. They want someone who, within minutes, <laughs> I say that laughing, um, but certainly within a couple of days, they have a, a handle on everything that's going on. So they will assimilate into any business immediately. And that allows them to deliver results 
um, just as quickly over a, a, a given period of time. And they have the ability to uh, coach and they have the ability to get things done and they have the ability to um, leave a legacy behind by transferring knowledge. And um, it's an immediate it's an immediate execution. So we, in interims, um, when, when we call them, they will need to be immediately available. So if someone's got even, even a four week notice period, it, it normally wouldn't work for us or our clients. So, so our, our clients will come to us and they will want to use interims because it's somebody who can start within 24 hours. Um, and there's a level of flexibility there, you know, so that they can, they can hire them for six months and then they can, they can part ways once the work is done, unlike bringing in a permanent person, which can have all sorts of complications once a permanent appointment's made. But also it might not necessarily need to be five days a week. In fact, quite often this year, uh, clients and interims have wanted to uh, hire people for two or three days a week. And again, that's something that's very, very difficult to do if you're bringing somebody in permanently. And, and just in a little bit more detail on the other side of the page, um, there's a, I mean, there is a myriad of reasons why our clients will call us or why clients will decide to bring in interims. Uh, and without wanting to read, you know, directly off the page, it is worth highlighting what they are. So change management, project management, turnaround is a big one, particularly in the last 18 months, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, it, here it says setting up new businesses or closing down old ones, which absolutely that does happen in, in our world, specifically in manufacturing. It could be setting up new factories or amalgamating up, um, old ones into new or modernizing. We see that a huge amount uh, when we're dealing with some of our industrial manufacturing clients. There can be um, very specific situations, uh, very, very specific situations that are specific to that business that need this more specialist need to uh, needs to be parachuted in you've got gap fill so that's almost like a classic recruitment model where everything's actually going okay with the company but for whatever reason somebody has been hit by um pardon the pun they've been hit by a bus and and they need to bring uh they need to bring an interim in asap uh to to make sure that the work doesn't get um left on the sides when working with private equity funds, uh, there's uh, all, all larger businesses when they're going through an acquisition, specialists will be brought in. Uh, and then, yeah, coaching, uh, team development, <clears throat> crisis management, and um, I skipped over one of them, which is a sudden increase in workload, which we, uh, which we saw in the pharmaceutical industry and the food industry in the last 18 months, where demand went through the roof right at the start of the pandemic. Uh, and it led to significant challenges, positive challenges, where clients needed to bring in interims to support with, uh, with the extra demand. So as a highly skilled professional who is marketing themselves as an interim, what are the essential attributes that you need to demonstrate? So um, continuous management, transformation, change management skills, absolutely essential absolutely essential um just as essential is highly effective communication skills without without that you cannot take people on a journey with you and by the very definition of being an interim more more often than not you will be responsible for making something happen and you can't do it on your own um in order to make that happen you need to be able to think strategically and you need to be able to think six months ahead maybe even 12 months ahead about what it is that the business needs and what legacy that you need behind. You've got to be flexible and adaptable. You have to be thinking about the end goal. So you are no longer operating as a permanent employee. You no longer have a job. You have clients and you're going in there to deliver them a specific outcome, much in the same way that KPMG do for their clients or Deloitte do for their clients. You are a one man or a one woman business that goes in and solves clients' problems, and you have to be outcomes focused when when you step into that mentality. Uh, and you have to that like you you can register with every interim provider under the sun. I work for one, and therefore um, I you know I, I can say with absolute sincerity that we we you know we are an absolute asset to people who are out there looking for work. But if you um, if you don't get out there and network yourself and hunt yourself for your projects and you're just relying on interim providers calling you, you will have long periods where you are not utilized. And depending on your personal circumstances and your personal preference, 
that can be quite stressful. So you need to think of yourself as a business. And in order for that business to grow, you need to market yourself and you need to pull on the necessary levers and utilize the necessary channels to generate work. <laughs> so, um, working as an interim, are you gonna be a millionaire within six months? Uh, of course you are. No, I'm, I'm joking. Um, here's um, the on, on the left. It's these are the uh, the the facts, and these these tend not to to change too much. You'll you you'll be involved in some really really interesting projects, and some of them are absolutely fantastic. I don't actually get to deliver them. I find the people that do it, and I thoroughly enjoy the process of talking to clients about these specific challenges, how can I help them, uh, and going to my network and then sort of having these commercial conversations with individuals, it's great. And um, you know, I find myself actually quite envious of my interns sometimes when they're actually then going in and, and getting it done. Uh, so it's, it's extremely stimulating, uh, which brings with it huge amount of um, satisfaction in what one is doing day in, day out, and, and reward. Um, not just financially, but if we want to land on that, it can, it can be very lucrative for, for successful interims. It provides variety, um, variety it provides uh, flexibility, and you're constantly going into different situations, meeting new people, expanding your network, learning about yourself, going around the country, going around the world. So, uh, so, so it really is a fantastic career choice and one that I'm a huge advocate of, but, but, um, a word of warning, uh, it isn't the land of milk and honey for everybody, for the reasons that I already referenced, which is you are all of a sudden out there on your own. And if you've been, if you've had a 20, 30 year career, uh, and as I mentioned, you've got to a certain level where um, you are sat on a board um, or you have been leading a division, and you've been used to that regular monthly paycheck coming in, you've been used to the pension getting topped out, you've been used to your annual bonus and so on and so forth, that with it creates a level of security and a level of stability, which is quite reassuring. You, you, then, you, you are completely on your own when you're working as an interim and you need to go out there um, and sing for your supper. And depending on people's personal circumstances, I'm just, I'll give my personal opinion on this. Uh, I, I personally believe that if an interim or if, if an individual decides to step into the interim market too soon, uh, it can sometimes permanently taint their view of that as a career choice. So typical things to be mindful of is if you've still got a big mortgage, if you've still got little ones living at home and, or, or teenagers and, and they're in a very expensive private school, if you've got um, other bills to pay, other people depending on you. If, if you're in a situation where you have this level of pressure and you had it covered when you were working in your permanent um, role and you wouldn't if you moved on, I, I would just give you a word of caution that that can create a level of stress and a level of tension uh, that can make working as an interim um, very hard. Uh, and, and we see people do that not so often anymore, but we used to see it quite a lot. And then very, very quickly, they'll jump back into permanent work. There's, in, there's, there's income fluctuation. There's significant periods of downtime uh, between projects. You know, I, I will often speak to people who are relatively naive and they'll say, oh yeah, I, just, I really like the idea actually of working for six months and then taking three months off in the summer and then working for six months. I'm like, whoa, 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 you need to slow down a bit. It doesn't work that way. You know, if you're working for six months and another project comes along, you jolly well need to take it. Trust me. So that it, it, it's um, it, that that is a very very uh, important thing for, to impress upon people. Um, you are uh, you 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 by the very definition of being an interim need to feel um, like you are parachuted into a business to be an agent of change, but you are not um, you're not permanently employed there. Uh, and it's a different mindset. And that with it can come a feeling of, of solitude. It's, and, and also that solitude can creep in when you're not working as well. Um, and sometimes you have to go in and make some very hard calls. You know, you have, to, you have to be the person that's going in and restructuring, or you have to be the person that goes in and decides not to promote uh, that person or 
that or, or that person needs to be moved into a different division. So there's some very, very hard calls that come with being um, a professional interim as well. Um, but hopefully, if somebody's got to a certain level in their career and is qualified to become an interim, they've been in a position where they've had to make tough calls um, over that period anyway. Okay, so thank you. Uh, that's great. Uh, lots to think about there, Lawrence. Uh, certainly, when I when I um, stepped into the profession, I thought I was going to be working for six months and taking six months on the beach. Um, but needless to say, uh, that never ever happened, and yeah. it's and it's unlikely to. Um, so, um, so questions in the Q and A tab please everyone uh, keep them coming um, so without further ado uh, let's move on to Simon Hudson of Morphosis Partners Simon words of introduction and then we'll move swiftly on absolutely well hello everybody and thank you Bruce and uh, very insightful thoughts indeed Lawrence um, very interesting, actually. You've got me thinking on some of that, which is quite interesting, so that's great. Uh, in terms of my background, uh, many years in the staffing industry, as you'll see on the biog there, and I suppose of note now, I co-found and co-run Morphosis Partners, which effectively has two hats. We have a hat supporting individuals, uh, which is going to be the topic of uh, the discussion today in terms of areas of learning and insights that will be very pertinent to the interim professional and things that we do to support uh, the corporate business. So any more information on me, by all means, reach out, but we'll move on to the slides, please. And let's- We will, there we are. About how to win business. So I'd like to think that each and every interim has that desire at heart, which is to win business and I think there are certain things just to set the scene particularly for those who are fairly new to the interim profession or just starting out which is there are certain realizations that you've, you've kind of got to come to terms with which uh, Lawrence uh, touched upon some of them but one is the fact that as a permanent employee even at the helm of a business you know your success in part was defined by the quality of the team and colleagues around you and as an interim, you've got to be minded to think about that. So as an interim, who are the team and colleagues and support advisors around you to enable you to make your ambitions as an interim successful? Because it's a very different game, uh, a very different landscape. And simply being technically very adept and very bright and very skilled, you would like to think should give you you know, granted access and open doors. But the reality is, is that that will open and be the case for some and not necessarily for all. So what can you do to try and mitigate your risk of undue unforeseen downtime and things like that? So the first thing to recognise is there is a transition that's occurred. Um, the second thing, of course, about an interim, uh, as Lawrence said, is the fact that you know, whether you use the term of being parachuted in, there is an expectation in that end client to say, can you solve our problem or help us realise an opportunity pretty damn quick? So there is an expectation on the interim to play with their best foot forward. It may seem a bit daft, but when you compare how permanent hires have been made, there's a lot of hiring that is made based on somebody's potential, you know, internal succession, for example, where people have seen and witnessed what you've done for a time and the relationships are there. As an interim, you've got to inject that sense of trust immediately. And you can only really do that by the credibility of the badges that play absolutely to your strengths. And, and the final thought about winning business that you've got to really be mindful of is the fact that, you know, a typical permanent role, okay, we know that a permanent role is, is having less average tenure. You're probably shifting a permanent role every three to five years nowadays at the exact level. But as an interim, it's at a very, very different dynamic. You may be searching for an assignment two or three times a year, potentially, depending on what your expertise is. And so the thing that really gets observed here is whilst that is great because you can apply your capabilities in differing environments through the politics, which, which will be a bonus for many, I'm sure, but actually the key skill that is required here is to be able to win that business, you know, to compete for assignments, to identify the assignments, 
and to be in control as best as you can of your onward future. So, so that hopefully just sets the tone and the scene. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, there you go, Simon. Thank you very much. So I suppose when it comes to how the cycle works and what that means in practice, it's really just a fairly logical footprint. You know, the first thing that you've got to do is to translate your, your acquired technical expertise, but in a way that forward faces. So for example, <clears throat> if you've had career experience that has had you in post in a permanent way for eight years here, five years there, when you're talking to people like Lawrence, for example, or you're engaging potential companies who have appetite for an interim, particularly if it's your first transition, you can't talk to them in, in the permanent language, you know, of, well, I was in a role for eight years and this is the collective of what was achieved. So first piece of advice about winning appetite of interest is to view those permanent roles as a series of projects. And those projects may have been multiple projects or cogs. Each one could be a continuum of six months that fed into another project, into another project. And suddenly you start to acquire the jargon and the language and the thinking that is typical of an interim mindset. The second thing that, that I would advise that people need to think about, to touch upon Lawrence's point, which is, whilst it would be great if every time you needed an assignment, an ISP was available with the perfect role for you, the reality is, is that's not always going to be the case. So absolutely, you need to maintain the right relationships there. But probably more important is actually to take a more proactive interpretation of, well, if I've got a clear view of what I'm bloody good at and where I think that is best applied, because that's what distinguishes an interim, you know, in terms of the persona of an interim, then the more clear you are on that, two things will happen. One, the more finite your realistic forward audience becomes. So, for example, if I just wanted to be an interim recruiter and I wanted to work in a sector agnostic way, let's say, for a market leader, you're probably talking to three or four firms, let's say. Um, so the more clear and focused you are, the more aware you should become about that market where your skill set should be more applicable. Uh, and the second thing that will happen with that clarity is, is that you will grow in your ability and confidence to relay and deliver that message. And certainly when you're in front of an ISP or in front of an end company, those people are looking to be able to see you, whether face to face or virtually in the whites of the eyes, and get that instant sense of trust from you that you're the guy or lady for them to pass that bat on to. So you've got to play to your strengths and you've got to be clear and focused on that. So by approaching those end companies and actively looking to reach out and build your network with them, you're elevating your brand, which in turn uh, will raise your visibility towards the ISPs and other quarters. So you've got to have the correct positioning and positioning means many things. But for me, it means things like social media in regards to, say, LinkedIn. Make sure that that message forward supports that if your intention is interim, that you effectively make it known. People aren't mind readers. Um, and second to that, start to think, think about your work prior as a, as a series of case studies or projects and focus on the projects that are consistent with the market demand in the sector that you're relevant to and use that as a way of communicating through your network and certainly use it as a means of com com conversation with the people that you're engaging with, either as ISPs or similar. So those things will definitely help to elevate your visibility over let's say other individuals who may be ideally wanting a permanent role but may simply be sat there thinking oh maybe a perm job sorry an interim job will be easier to get in the intervening period the reality is it probably isn't but you can find yourself in competition with people like that um, and of course as you go through those discussions and processes you've got to negotiate the right terms and then of course you then get to deliver on the assignment itself so if you imagine that wheel in practice it means that you're probably giving, you know, maybe a third of your time actually delivering to your passion to what you truly want to do. And the rest of the time is the branding, the marketing, the positioning, the networking. And when you're on assignment, you lower those other attributes down to maybe 10 or 15 percent. So you maintain a ripple so that when you do come off assignment, you're not starting from scratch, which becomes the biggest risk factor for you know, a growing period of 
uh, you know, sort of income uh, uh, sort of gaps or uh, utilization gaps. So be minded that success as an interim brings in quite a lot of new components. Next slide, please, Bruce. So where can you go? For these assignments well clearly isps are a very good uh, point of reference and like lawrence pointed out the clients that he and others will be talking to when that conversation occurs it's like we've got a need now who have you got now so so they isps are really good for getting a sense of are you relevant to a mandate now but the point is you either fit the mandate or you don't so if you don't fit the assignment brief what do you do what are the other things that you can do well certainly from our perspective and the clients that we support you know we're really focused on helping them to build their networks to build their marketing propositions so that they have less time uh you know being underutilized so existing network is definitely definitely uh one of the key things that you need to go to get those people repositioned and what we mean by repositioned is some of those people may, may be chairman, if you're being very senior, they could be chief execs elsewhere, CFOs and similar. So have the conversation with them to get them to accept you, not based on how you were, i.e., you know, you were my technical director or ops director and you were great for the 10 years we worked with each other, but use the existing network as an opportunity to reposition. And what I mean by that is, get them informed and in agreement that where you're trying to go is one that makes sense. And the key thing I mean about that is people are very good at putting people in boxes based on that first time of experience. So if you see that some of your existing former contacts are in businesses of potential relevance, uh, that they've got that, that, that sort of gravitas and got that connectivity, then make sure that they are forward supportive of what you're trying to achieve. Because interestingly enough, nearly a quarter of assignments first wins come from the people that you're already known to. So, so don't ignore that. That's certainly a good piece of advice. You've then got to think about competitors because, you know, if somebody's worked, for example, within a particular retailer or manufacturing business, then consider networking and developing contacts with companies that are very similar. Certainly from our perspective, uh, that would make a lot of logical sense and ensure even the ISPs would be advocating in their own business development activities, things of a similar theme. Um, and then, of course, when you're thinking about standing out as an interim, just be minded that the key skill set that you're looking to take forward won't be, for example, that I've been a permanent CFO and now I'm an interim CFO, it has to be more specific than that. It has to be something like, well, yes, absolutely, I'm an experienced CFO, but actually my niche, my key expertise is around taking a business successfully through IPO or delivering a transformation around ERP or whatever it may be. It's those added assets. So think about the situation that you are very used to and have become very adept at and base your stories in your networking around those elements. Uh, next slide, please, Bruce. And, and if we think about why is this important? Well, for the majority of people venturing out to be interim, they're doing it because they have an idealized view of what they would ultimately want to get from it. One is more control. One is more empowerment around their time and what they choose to do. So there's an awful lot of positive drivers to why individuals seek out a career as an interim professional. But ultimately, you've got to think about, well, if I'm the buyer of an organisation, what would I pay premium day rate for in terms of perception of premium? You're paying for quick deliverables, as Lawrence has talked about. You're paying for expertise to hit the ground running. You're paying for that confidence that my problem is resolved by passing it to this individual. So the better you are at fitting to your own sense of your own skill set and aligning that to businesses where they'll be able to recognize it, then you'll be in a far, far stronger bargaining position when it comes to, you know, ultimately being able to win the assignment rather than getting frustrated that maybe you were picked in an interview process because somebody had more of this or less, whatever it may be. 
there's a lot you can do about choosing which assignment opportunities to compete for in the first place. And that comes down to having the confidence to really define what your niche within a marketplace is so that you're able to stand out. And if you follow that thread through on that slide, then ultimately we can't say we guarantee 100% utilization. And as Lawrence intimated, you'll potentially, you could be a millionaire in six months, let's say, if you adopt these processes. But what you should find is that compared to the norm average, you'll be in a much stronger, confident place. And, you know, our sort of doctrine is when you combine preparedness with connectivity to the right audience, your success factor, your look factor will greatly improve. So hopefully that's 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 useful in regards to that slide. Next slide. And we are there. So thank you for listening. That's uh, wonderful as always, Simon. Lots of food for thought. I take new things out of that every time I hear <laughs> you speak. Um, so if we're following the chat, we'll see that um, we, we've got uh, some of the attendees uh, setting out what they're doing. So Gavin is in FMCG, Ops Projects Change Management. Um, Cosmo there is in Metals and Mining. Joe Gardner, um, who I think said did manufacturing. Um, and I think that's probably in your space there, Lawrence. Marcus is, is in FMCG. Uh, what the attendees are telling us is whether they're interim um, at the moment or what, whether they're permanent. Uh, be good to understand a little bit more about kind of what's on your minds, guys, uh, that's um, sort of prompting you to consider interim as a career. So uh, keep, keep the chat coming. Questions in the Q&A, please. So um, as the questions are coming in, and we've got plenty of time um, for those, I'm going to hand over now to Tony Evans for the commercial break uh, to just explain to the audience um, why any interim thinking about a career or, or, or actually uh, having embarked on a career uh, should be considering joining the IIM, uh, which is the, uh, the only UK body representing uh, the interests of uh, executive interim. So without further ado, Tony Evans. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Bruce. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you've been finding the um, webinar um, stimulating and useful. Um, there's not much point to tell you anything other than the fact that I'm a practicing interim. I work at CEO level. I also happen to be chair of the Institute. Um, and if uh, Bruce would be kind enough to ping the um, slide on, then um, we've already uh, indicated that we are the only UK professional body exclusively for interim practitioners. Um, but why should you think about uh, even considering parting with some of your hard-earned money to become a member or apply for membership of the Institute? Um, on the left-hand side, uh, it describes the kinds of things that we do do uh, for the membership. Um, and we, I think, principally help the membership in terms of building a network, both with other interims who are um, going to be supportive, recognizing that everybody has a share, a shared um, view of the world and, and the recognition that it can be lonely out there. So uh, that's the starting point, really. Um, we do have a good working relationship with pretty much all of the, the best ISPs in the marketplace, not least New Street Consulting Group. So I should at this point say thank you very much to Lawrence this morning for coming along to talk with us. Um, it's much appreciated. Uh, and we also produce an annual survey, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. If you're not, can I suggest that you take a trip down the road, uh, as it were, to our website, which is iim.org.uk. 
uh, you'll find on the home page uh, access to that survey. It's the biggest piece of work done annually in the market in the interim space, um, and it'll give you an idea of how how things are. It also includes um, an annual view from all the uh, interims who participate in the survey, and that's typically two or 3,000 people each year. Um, and they'll give you a view on how they are seeing the performance of the various ISPs. Um, and I'm uh, always keen to see who's, who's doing well with that. Um, New Street are always up there, top three positions all the time. It's, uh, it's good to see, and, and rightly so, because they do a cracking job. On the right-hand side, you can see the kinds of things that uh, you can gain some access to in terms of things that we do do to help support people. Um, for your membership, you will get um, a financial benefit in the sense that we provide um, uh, tax investigation insurance as part of your membership. Um, your membership fee is uh, tax deductible against your uh, profitability. And uh, we uh, have taken the time and the trouble to identify relevant professional indemnity insurance policies because reading the small print is important they're not all the same um, and to get something that's going to be relevant to you as a professional interim uh, and to be able to feel comfortable with that and get that at a good price um, so there are a number of other things there ir35 is a big issue uh, you're probably all familiar or heard about heard about it by now the latest activity we've undertaken as an institute is to provide evidence to the House of Lords Finance Bill Subcommittee, which called for evidence, which uh, was completed uh, Monday of last week. So can I go on uh, to another slide? Um, of course please? you can, Tony. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah right. of course you can. There Probably. you go. Great. OK, so... Associate membership is the level of membership for people who are coming into the profession. So no real track record, um, but have decided that they want to um, make uh, the transition from a career point of view and commit to it. Um, there is an offer for the rest of, uh, well, for the next month, um, if you wish to apply for joining as a result of attending the, um, uh, the webinar this morning, if you use the, on going to the website to apply for membership, um, the uh, nomenclature intro nov, so I-N-T-R-O-N-O-V, then that would give you a discount equivalent to the administration fee for application. Is that all uppercase, Tony, or does it, it, doesn't is, it matter? Yeah, yeah. No, intro it's all north, uppercase. Intro north what? I'm just going to put this in the chat. Right, thank you. Yeah. Is that is that correct? That's him. Yeah, spot on. And that gives you a discount of how much? The £40, the equivalent of the £40 application fee. Okay, if you're, an, if you're a practicing interim and, and you're on here to see what's going on, then please feel free to apply as well if you're not already a member. Um, the full membership fee is actually a little more. It's £160 a year. Okay. okay. And Thanks. for that, it gives you access to members-only stuff, including a bunch of things particularly relevant to IR35 and and contracts which are compliant and how you work that out and stuff like that. And there's also a full uh, a full um, programme of webinars. Um, mm. In fact, we had, I think, six or seven over the summer where, where uh, on the back of the annual survey, uh, we had representative panels from the top three ISPs. So this was an opportunity for our members to interact with 21, so seven times three, of the top recruiters uh, across the industry. Mm. And uh, I mean, trust me, that is gold dust. Uh, that's, that's worth paying the 160 quid for. In fact, the survey 
is worth paying 160 quid for because it gives you a curated list of your target market if you want to um, source assignments through interim service providers like New Street and Lawrence. So Cosmo has, thanks Cosmo for the first question. That's great. Uh, Cosmo says it's his first interaction with the IIM. So welcome. I hope it was painless for you, Cosmo. <laughs> um, but he says, typically, who are ISPs and how do they differ from the usual senior recruiters and headhunters? Now, I think that's a, con that's a question straight at once. Okay, it's quite a big question. Um, who are ISPs? So, stands for interim service providers, which is another way of saying uh, recruitment businesses that specialize solely um, in the placement of interim professionals. And when I use the word interim, I take that to mean the sorts of people that we've just been talking about, not to be confused and no disrespect to them, but not to be confused with the contracting market. Uh, that's different. Uh, so people who work as professional contractors, the day rates might be slightly lower. Um, it might be people who are in management level roles uh, and um, they might not have uh, been uh, their as far down the road with their professional life. So interim management providers, ISPs, specialise in the placement of uh, senior individuals going into the specialised sorts of positions that we've just talked about. How do we differ from executive? So, so that's what we do. That's what our organisation does. Um, the, so I used to work for one of the big global recruitment businesses um, how do we, how is, how is it different? I mean, it, to be honest, I could talk about this for 10 hours, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a very, very different interaction, both with interims and with, uh, and with clients. Uh, it's a very pleasurable interaction. It's not a sales role. Um, so a lot of recruitment companies can get a um, bad reputation, sometimes unfairly, sometimes it's very justified because they can be very salesy and they can be very pushy and they can try and convince people to take roles that they don't want to, and they can try and convince a client that a candidate's perfect when they're clearly not. Um, you can't get away with that uh, at the senior levels because the hiring manager, the private equity fund, the CEO, it isn't going to listen to that kind of salesmanship. And the interims aren't going to listen to that kind of uh, salesmanship. So it's um, it, it's I, I, it's a pleasure to do what I do. And it's a, it's a privilege that I don't take lightly because I'm talking to people that are at the very top of their game. And I'm talking to clients who have trusted me with you know, some very, very important strategic decisions that they need to make. So, um, so the experience that you would have when dealing with one of the better ISPs, and I would um, encourage you to... Um, follow Tony's advice and go and have a look at the, the IIM survey, which will show you who the businesses are, who the ISP providers are that do things properly. And the reason why the report is so important is because that, that, that report shines a light on what the interim community think of, um, of the ISPs. So you can see who the companies and who the individuals out there are um, that are getting good feedback. But if you're dealing with a sensible outfit that's well ranked, doesn't necessarily need to even be the top 10. They just need to be a sensible outfit that's well ranked. Uh, you will find that you are having um, positive commercial conversations with individuals that are well positioned to help you. The, um, the difference, uh, executive search firms will they, will, they work at the same level as us, uh, but their model is completely different. You know, they will, they will take on a mandate and they will deliver on that mandate and it can take two to three months, sometimes longer. We'll take on, on a mandate and we're expected to deliver, to deliver on that mandate from anything between two to three days to two to three weeks. So the speed that we work out is very, very different. We've got a large executive search division here at the group and I, I rub shoulders with our head of exec search, Jerome Ball, quite regularly. And um, we, yeah, we, we get along famously. He's a brilliant bloke and we've got a huge amount in common in terms of our personal interests, but, but in terms of the way that we work, we are polar opposite. I'm very 
fast paced. I like to get right into the nub of things and I like to have quick half an hour conversations with interims when I'm putting them forward for roles. Um, and that's that, you know, we need to move at speed on the, on the exec search side. Um, it involves a face to face meeting, which can sometimes be two or three hours, psychometric testing, personality profiling, and so on and so forth. And, you know, by, by the, if we did all of that, when running an interim process, I, my competitors would eat my lunch. So it, it moves, there's a velocity and there's a tenacity to kind of what we, uh, what we do, which is normally a little bit different as well. Um, I think, I think I'm covering the main points there. It's, it's obviously a topic I could talk about for a long time. So thank you very much for the question, but hopefully that's, uh, that's yeah. good so I'm going to, um, I mean, we've got another question coming in, which is uh, similar on, on, on a similar topic from Joe. Any advice on format of CV for interim positions as compared to permanent? Uh, is the CV the best way to introduce yourself to the ISP? So, so I'm going to I'm going to bring in um, Simon and then uh, I'll bring in Lawrence back on that. But again, just back to Cosmo's question. And this is an example that happened to me. Now, bear in mind, I've been doing this, as I said, for, for nearly 30 years. I was, I was uh, unfeasibly young when, when I started uh, working on my own account. I don't think it was even called in, interim then. I was probably about 13, I think, uh, to, to be fair. But I first met a lady from one of the ISPs about 10 years ago in a cafe. I think it was in one of the department stores um, uh, on, the, on the top floor in Sloan Square. I, I seem to recall something like that. We had a chat. We kept in touch. And she went to work for one of the ISPs. And they, they for whatever reason, I think there was a couple of nibbles at a conversation but nothing no assignment concrete came out of that uh she subsequently moved to another provider who are one of the full service providers so they deal with permanent recruitment and they have an interim division and uh th this particular organization are were were on the hunt for a chief commercial officer and that recruitment process is going to take about six months. Um, they talked about how they could uh, keep the momentum in their program. And that resulted in me being parachuted into that program. Uh, and that's on the basis of a conversation that has, 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 and that's the first time I've worked with this lady uh, after 10 years of first being introduced to her. Uh, when she was working, uh, probably this this is probably her third job since th the third ISP. So, that, so what's the point of that story? The point of that story is it's probably more about the individuals than the actual firm, but it's probably a bit about both. Uh, and just keep your network because you just never know when 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 that phone's going to ring or when you need to pick up the phone to that individual. Um, so that's my personal story on that. Um, on the on the CV question, um, let's go to uh, Simon Hudson first on that one. Uh, okay, so uh, hopefully I won't get uh, horrible views or looks from Lawrence about what I'm about to say here. So hopefully the advice is consistent with his expectation because um, if I'm getting it wrong, there's a problem. But uh, in terms, well, there's two questions here. So the one is, is the CV the best way to introduce yourself? So let's pick on that one first, and then we'll talk about a format. Um, I would actually say no uh, is the short answer, but let me sort of give a bit of meat to that. Um, clearly, the ISP individuals will want to have a sense on who you are, what you're about, what are your credentials? And I think the challenge you have if you're moving to interim for the first time with a CV is that typically they are written in a very different kind of way and format. And often when you are in a position to have a first conversation with an ISP, each ISP will have a slightly tweaked view on what they want, what suits them, what serves them in their, their respective sectors. But typically they will be keen to understand your numbers and this may be a bit of a shocker for people but it it kind of surprises me how many senior execs i talk to and i've really got to push quite hard for to get any sense of deliverables from them what have they actually achieved 
So I think if it comes to a CV as a permanent format, you've really got to rework that. Um, so in terms of is the CV best to get to an ISP, I would say in most cases, if you've got the opportunity to have an advocate that can introduce you or recommend you to an ISP, that is far more likely to elevate your visibility to a particular ISP. So for example, let's say that in your network, you happen to know somebody who is themselves an interim professional who's connected to one or two of the ISPs. You know, if they maintain a good relationship with the ISPs, then they could potentially be the advocate to introduce you into that individual consultant. Now, whilst your expertise may be in contrast to that person, you know, if, for example, uh, an interim that Lawrence was already aware of, for example, was to approach him and say, you know, here's the catch up call, what's going on, etc., but then in the throw of that dice to say, oh, by the way, Lawrence, you know, there's a great colleague of mine, you know, Joe, she's transitioning into the interim world. I think she's fantastic. Her expertise is ABC. Would you be open to having a, a brief conversation with her to explore and to give advice? That's much more likely to probably get some sense of response and reaction than a CV going in blindly. Um, so that's my first point on that. And in terms of a CV to follow when it does come to supply of information around the format, um, a lot of ISPs, certainly from my knowledge and the relationships I maintain, are they're quite keen on getting references. They're quite keen on having case studies. Um, so a CV becomes part of the toolkit. And one of the things that Lawrence said about the difference between interim recruiters and headhunters is headhunters often have a more protracted time frame when it comes to considering candidates, shortlisting and all the rest of it and assessments and all things come in. What an ISP typically wants to do is to qualify you pretty damn quick to know what your expertise is, what are your capabilities, and to have case studies that give them essentially the opportunity to paint a picture with the client in order to help to convey your relevance and your value. So in terms of format of CV, focus on numbers, focus on the situations that you're very adept at. So certainly have a look at your existing CV in regards to those areas. But my general advice is that for an ISP, they will ultimately want more than that. So to get ahead of the curve, think about case studies, think about scenarios or projects or situations and bring that together with a CV that probably then looks nice and neat and succinct, but is focused on numbers and what's being delivered. And that would be the advice I'd give. I think before I just bring in Lawrence on, on this one, I think what I picked up there and an interesting um, distinction uh, between permanent and interim, I think you said, is that when a permanent, when, when, when a search happens, the permanent recruiter will have no idea who the candidates are. They will be researching, they will be researching the market. And, and in fact, I, I suppose the client will be skeptical if they're paying all this money for an executive search if the if the if the recruiter pulls one out the pocket blue peter style and says you know here here's, here's what one, I made earlier <laughs> here, 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 here here's one I made earlier because I mean you know typically the way the way the fee structure the third the third the third works is, is is that they're doing this kind of scan of the market they're doing competitor analysis they're doing due diligence and there's no preconceived outcome in the in the interim world it's completely different. When, when, the, when, when, the, when the lady introduced me to the client, what she said to the client and what she said to me was, Bruce, when I heard this, you were the first name that sprang to mind. And, and that's why, you know, within, within a week or 10 days after we danced around the handbags a bit, I was actually in there working. And, and, and I think that's probably what Lawrence, you know, you, you would say, and what Simon has said, is that you, you pre-qualified these people, you understand what they do, um, or certainly, you know, you, you either have 100% understanding of what they do, or, or you know what they've done, and it's just a question of, you know, dusting it off, uh, revisiting the conversation, and, ca and catching up with what they've been doing currently so we'll give you the final well we'll give tony the final word but just before we do launch do you want to come in on the best way to engage with an isp we, we've got a couple of minutes left 
Thank you for your thoughts, Simon. They were spot on, to be honest. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, the best way to engage with an ISP, uh, pick the ones that you know work in your space. Yeah. Because so, otherwise you are banging your head against a brick wall and you're going to get wound up. You, you are going to get wound up because you're going to try and call people who are... See, they, I mean, we're all busy, but our, our ISPs, like in, people who do what I do for a living, every second of every day is spoken for because you've got demanding clients that want CVs yesterday or you're running around trying to make sure that you're doing exactly what Bruce just articulated, which is kind of um, harvesting that, that network of relevant ISPs. If you, if you call somebody, and, and sorry for the pun, you're an apple, and that, that, that ISP only wants oranges, you, you're probably not going to get a call back and, and it will ruin your opinion of ISPs. So pick the ones who you know can help you and stick, and stick to them with um, a sensible contact pattern. So an email once a quarter if you've not heard from them, a coffee once a year, maybe twice a year, um, if these are people who you know can genuinely help you. And then do that with four or five that you know play in your space whilst... Um, um, furnishing and nourishing your own network and doing your own marketing and talking to the people that you're reaching out to directly. See them as a supplementary tool. And um, if all of them provide you with one assignment over a three to five year period, and you've got three or four of them in your hopper, you'll do well over a decade. That is how an I a really good, that's how your dynamics should work with an ISP. But if you engage with one and within a year they've not found you something and you've not called them and, and, I, and, and they've not called you back, the relationship will die on the vine and you'll think that they, that, that provider was rubbish. And um, that's not in, it's, not, it's in neither party's interest. So pick your winners, back them, stick with them through thick and thin because eventually it will come good. Thank you, Juan. So we've come to the end. I just want to uh, thank everybody. Uh, I'll, our speakers and panelists, thank you for giving of your time. I'd like to thank you, the audience. I'll hand over to Tony Evans uh, just to say the concluding remarks. Thanks, Tony. Uh, thanks very much, Bruce. Um, firstly, can I just say thank you very much to you all for, for taking the time out to be with us today. A uh, particular thank you to Lawrence and to Simon for giving of their time in order to be able to uh, give their insights about uh, entry points and things to think about joining the profession. It's a great place to be. Um, and I have to make a final point, of course, which says, and it's a better place and an easier place if you actually consider applying for membership of the Institute. Um, if anybody wishes to follow up, um, then please feel free to do so. You can see within the deck here and on the screen now, contact points for myself and for member services. Um, I think Bruce made the point on the chat that uh, we're more than happy to connect up on LinkedIn, uh, which is always good practice to extend the network. Uh, and can I wish you all um, success in thinking through how you want to go about your uh, uh, entree to, uh, to the interim world. And thank you very much indeed. Well, and on that note, we'll close the meeting. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.